We're human. All right, Bob, I'll wait for you to pull it up. We'll start all over again. Welcome, everybody. Gives the people a chance to get in here. All right, are we ready? Awesome. Good, 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 good. It's just good to see everybody here this morning. Let's take a time of prayer. And I've asked Pam to come up and uh, put her on the spot. She'll be led of the Spirit. We want to pray over our missionaries this morning. But let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Um, asking for just, not just asking, we're here to worship. We're here to worship. High King of heaven, be thou our vision. It seems, Lord, we get distracted by so many things in life, whether that's our personal choice or the devil's distractions or just life. We get distracted. It's just good to come and kind of be quiet and know that you're God to realize that we're here on purpose. Not just here on earth, we're here in church on purpose. It's just good to take a few moments, Lord, and confess our sin before you and be refreshed in your forgiveness. Thank you for when we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you for the gift of faith and the gift of prayer. Thank you that we come before you and we are still before you, we dance before you, we are joyful before you because you're God. I pray this morning for people's hearts and lives who have come into this building, people online worshiping with us. Father, we all have troubles in our heart. We have troubles in situations in life. 
And we need to hear your words, Jesus, when you said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. We certainly say we believe in you and we believe also in you, Jesus. And so, Heavenly Father, we just come before you asking for your healing grace on the troubles of anyone's heart. And whether those be perceived troubles or real issues of our life, we just thank you. We plead your blood, Lord Jesus, over our lives, over our church, over our celebrations of life. We thank you. I pray for your physical healing in people's lives right now who need healing from different situations of life, whether it's back issues, knee problems, just the strength to get around. Lord, that's, that's sometimes a life issue, just getting around. And we just pray for your strength and your power and your healing. Thank you that you brought us in here. And I thank you for every visitor that has come into the, to the building today. And for every person who visits us online, that you would just minister to them in a powerful way. Thank you for your love shed abroad in our hearts. Thank you for your love, that we love you and we love people because you first loved us. Thank you. Father, we take a moment to just lift uh, our missionaries before you, those who you have sent. Though it's true that we're all missionaries and we all have a place to do your work, some you have sent. So we lift them before you now. All over the world, Father, I've been hearing about troubles around the world and um, how you protect them, how they still are able to do your work, do your, bring your word, bring your love, be your hands and feet, and you have protected them. So we give you thanks and we give you glory. And we ask that you continue to do that as we know that you really will. Um, Jeff and Annie, Lord, they have shared um, things that are going on in the spirit realm around them, in their physical lives, in their building. And as we read those things, Lord, we lift them before you, thanking you, like I said, for, for their protection, for their provision. And we just want to um, be aware and to call upon your Holy Spirit to continue that work, to bless them, to strengthen them in Jesus' name. And we thank you for um, the provisions that you've given to Jay as she um, has tried to set up a place to live, tried to um, do what she is called to do, and running up against wall after wall, obstacle after obstacle, but your goodness and your provision is apparent. So we just lift her before you, thanking you for those provisions and asking that you would open doors, that you would bring people, that hospitality would be recognized and that you would just provide. Thank you for protection, across border crossings for all of our missionaries. We trust you, Jesus. And um, they go for us, and we are so grateful. In Jesus' name, amen.
All right. Good. Good, good. Good to see everybody again. I shall not want. All right, we'll have a kid's story in just a moment. I want to remind you, especially if you're brand new to the church this morning, we have a meal upstairs, uh, appreciation meal. A little conflict of interest for me to announce that, I think. But um, you're all invited. So in case you came here and you weren't planning on it or you forgot about it, we have a meal. Uh, just It's good to fellowship together over a meal. So please. Even if you forgot to bring something, you're just invited to attend. I also wanted to remind you that um, this month of October, we're asking all of us to sacrifice in some way to give to the World Mission Offering. A third of it will go to Jay, a third of it will go to Jeff and Annie, as you heard Pam praying for them, and a third of it to the big offering that helps other missionaries. We're asking you to sacrifice, not to substitute your regular giving, but to sacrifice. Uh, maybe it's the coffees you drink. That's a big sacrifice, isn't it? Whatever it is, there are envelopes in your pews. If you write a check uh, and you make it out to the church, you've got to put on the memo line, WMO, so we know where it's going. Because if you don't write it on the memo line, um, it won't go to that probably because we don't know. We're not mind readers yet. So, <laughs> so put on your check. World Mission Offering at the memo line if you, if you are writing a check. And thank you for giving. Thank you for giving to this special love offering, but thank you for giving to our regular offering that supports and we minister. We're, gonna, we're changing our crisis meal thing tonight. We're going later. And so thank you all that are on that team as we go to that. All right, Jessica, you're ready. This is Jessica's first time to do the children's story. I don't think she's going to have a problem being a school teacher herself, but come on up, kids. Thank you for the introduction. All right. All the kids come up. We, I know we've got more because I think my kids are half of the crew, so. <laughs> all right. You guys can have a seat right over here, right up front. You guys can. Yeah, nice job. Have a seat. You guys will want to be front row. All right, yep, find your spot. Get nice and cold. Because you have to whisper to your partner some guesses today. So, okay, all of you got to sit down. Okay, you can sit down. That's right, sit down with everybody else. All of you sit down. There we go. Well, they're not supposed to sit. All right, I'm going to have you hold this. Sorry, my kids are too excited because I think they sort of know what we're doing. So. <laughs> okay. All right. Are you guys excited or what? Yeah? You guys excited to have had four days off from school? Yeah. yeah, I bet you forgot everything, didn't you? Yeah, I know. Can you believe it? Isn't it so nice to have a little bit of vacation, though? I know. It's always hard to go back after four days off. I think I forgot what I was supposed to be doing tomorrow, too. But, um, well, if you guys don't know me, my name is Miss Jessica, and these are my four kids right over here. And I think I know some of you guys from Sunday school, too. And I'm so excited to be here. Pastor Ross asked me to talk with all of you guys today, and I thought, I can do this. Usually I have to teach classes all day long, but for like an hour. So this will be great for just a couple minutes to talk with all of you guys. So, um, well, this is, can you guys help me out? Do you guys know what season we're in? What season are we in? Fall. Let's all say it on three. One, two, three. Fall. All right. Raise your hand if you guys like fall. One more. Oh, one more. Here we go. Okay. Yeah, you can have a seat right over here. Yeah. What's that? Oh, you were going to tell me that. You want to say it out loud? Huh? Fall. Oh, okay. All right. Now, my birthday's in fall, so I really love fall. And today I kind of thought, gosh, what could I talk about? Because this is such a beautiful season. I thought that what we could do is we, we could play a little guessing game today. Do you guys like doing guessing games? Okay. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to open up our, we're going to practice today opening up our hearts to all the different ways that we see God around us this season. Because you know what? If you guys are like my kids, they have a lot going on this season, right? We had school that started. There's probably lots of sports you guys are doing. Your parents are probably raking leaves like all the time. And everybody's busy, busy, busy. Just like Pastor Ross was talking about earlier. And sometimes it's hard to kind of quiet down a little bit and hear God speaking to us, even when we're busy. So today it's going to take a little bit of practice. And I think you guys are going to be able to go on throughout the week after we practice using our senses. All right, are you ready? Okay. So we're going to start with our first clue. Are you guys ready? You gotta close your eyes. Close your eyes. All right, we're gonna start with our first clue. I'm gonna give you a clue. All right, here we go. 
Okay. I know. Okay. Okay. All right, I'm going to let you guys smell something. Okay. Are you guys ready? Okay. Now, this is something that reminds me of what we taste and we might smell this season. When I come by you, you can take a big whiff. You can smell it. Now, don't open your eyes yet. You ready to smell it? You can smell it. <laughs> We're not going to smell the bag quite yet, but you can smell what I put in front of you. Can you smell that? Okay. All right. You ready to whisper to your shoulder partner, somebody next to you? What do you guys smell? Did you guys smell anything? No? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> okay. Well, what I had you guys smell was something that smelled like pumpkins. Do you guys see pumpkins around this time of year? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to let you guys put something in your baggies today to help you guys to remember. Okay. Okay. You guys get to take one of these and put them in your bag. Okay, you can pass them around. That's okay. Now, do you guys realize all the different ways that we see God around us with all the different vegetables, all the pumpkins that we see? God puts lots of things on our table, doesn't he? From pumpkins to food. Yes, you can just put them in your bag. Sorry, I'm losing these guys. <laughs> I should have brought candy today, maybe. <laughs> okay, so you guys have them in your bags? Just two is fine. Okay. All right. Okay. So now when you guys eat those pumpkins, when you guys leave today, think about all the different ways that God puts food on our tables, okay? And appreciate all of that we have in front of us and that we get to enjoy every day, okay? Yeah, you just put them in your bag. Yep, you got it. Okay. All right, now close your eyes. We're going to do another guessing game. Everybody's going to sit down in three, two, one. Okay, you can go to your mom. That's fine. Okay, sit down. Just sit down. All right, close your eyes. Are you ready? Close your eyes in three, two, one. Now we practice talking about what we taste and what we smell, okay? Now we're going to think about all the different ways that God blesses us with what we look at this season. There's a lot that we can look at that show. Just, you can just sit down. Okay. The beauty of God is around us when we go down the sidewalks and we look at the beautiful trees and all the different colors. Now I'm going to put something in your hands. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. And be reminded of all the different ways that God blesses us with his beauty. This time of year, there's so many different colors that we see that remind us of God. Even when we're busy, we can appreciate all the beauty with what we see this time of year. Okay. All right. Are you ready to open your eyes on three? One, two, three. All right. What do you guys see? A leap, that's right, okay. So when you guys are going on a walk, take some time to slow down. You guys, can just sit down. Okay, sit down. you guys can look at all the different ways that God is around you when you go for a walk with your parents and you're in the stroller. Use your eyes to see all the different ways that God blesses us with. Yeah, that's exactly right, you got it. <laughs> all right, okay, last but not least, we're gonna listen to something that reminds me of an animal that is really good at listening, even when things are tough and busy. Did you know that this special animal this time of year uses echolocation? Do you guys know what that is? They use the sounds, they, they use their sense of hearing to find food. Are you guys ready to guess? Okay, I'm gonna play something for you. Here we go. Are you ready to make a guess? Okay, let's count on three. One, two, three. Bat. 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 Okay. Now, if you guys didn't know what that sound was, that was a bat. And you know what? Bats are so interesting this time of year because they use their sense of hearing to find things. So when we're really, really busy this week and you guys have all kinds of activities going on and your teachers are talking to you and you just can't quite focus, you know what? Think of all of your senses and all the different ways that we can open up our hearts to God this week. And throughout the whole season, even when we're really, really busy, okay? All right, now I have a little bat for to give you guys before you guys go. Hold on. I think it's right in here. Oh, you want to pass it to everybody one of those? Okay. All right. That's okay. We'll put it right in here. You can put it right in there. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. All right. Okay. Um, all right. All good job. <laughs>
Okay. It's okay. <laughs> I should have done it all myself. I don't think I needed uh, any extra help. Okay. All right, all of you ready? Okay. <laughs> all right, you guys can put them on your bags and look at those amazing animals and think of how well they can hear and listen. All right, and Olive, do you want to go ahead and... Uh, okay. All right. We're going to end with our special prayer before we go today, thinking about how we're going to open up our hearts to God and use all of our senses so we can really hear and see God. So we're going to let Olive go ahead, and it has a little... Okay. Dear Lord, help us to see ourselves more fully, so our senses more fully, so that we might become more alive and hear God's voice within us this season. Amen. Amen. Okay. All right, you guys. So go off this week. Think of all your senses and all the different ways that you guys can use all of your senses to hear God, even when we're busy. Okay. All right. Thank you.
We bless you today, Father, for your goodness and your greatness. Thank you, Lord, that you are worthy of all praise. We bless you today with sound, with song, with words, with movement, with groans and sighs, because you are good. Amen. You may be seated and the children can go to Sunday school. Turn in your Bibles with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10, and Luke chapter 7, uh, probably verses 18 through 20. Uh, there's a little segment in there about John the Baptist. For those of you that are new this morning, and for all of us who need a refresher, I'm preaching on a series called Our Most Holy Faith. We have a holy faith given to us by the Holy Spirit and, and handed down to us from centuries of church tradition and the Bible, <laughs> obviously. But we're in a culture, I believe, and I'm not the only one who believes it. I think you do too. I think you've seen it in your life where many in our culture deconstruct and they devalue beliefs. I don't like the word deconstructionism. I just call it wrestling with angels. I call it um, doubts, wrestling with doubts. I call it not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, because I think that's what happens with people. I've talked about landmines. Landmines of personal tragedies. Who of us have not had personal tragedies? And sometimes those personal tragedies cause you to doubt the goodness of God. I understand that. Uh, for two sermons, I've talked about church hurt. I'm not going to talk about church hurt today, but church hurt is very real. It seems more prevalent in our culture today, where people say, I love Jesus, but I can't stand the church. Um, so that could happen. And, and has happened, perhaps, in our lives. This morning, and probably, because I can't cram everything into today, somebody say amen to that, um, I'm going to talk about unanswered questions. And I'm going to start with a funny story called Ever Been Confused. Um, unanswered questions are related to personal tragedies, related to church hurt, maybe just related to life in general, if all I do this morning is set up the problem, I will, I will accomplish that much. But I, hopefully I'll give you some strategies. But turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. I think the great apostle Paul was confused about a painful thing in his life called the thorn in the flesh. We don't know what that thorn was. That's not the point of my message this morning. It's how he dealt with it, and sometimes he was confused by it. And to keep me from being too elated by the abundance of revelations because he went to heaven and came back, I believe he's talking about himself, a thorn was given to me in the flesh. We don't know what that thorn was. Some believe it's physical. Some believe it was a sinful trait in his life. Some believe it was a misunderstanding. I think it was something very deep and emotional and very hurtful in his life, but he calls it a message, messenger of Satan to harass him, to keep him from being too elated. Okay, so Paul prayed for healing for people. So why not heal yourself in the power of the Holy Spirit? Three times he says, I besought the Lord about this thorn, that it should leave me. Okay, God, you're gonna, you're gonna stop this confusion. You're gonna take away this thorn. Apparently, at this point of writing, Paul or God did not remove the thorn. 
But God said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. What, it, it, Paul did have an answer, but it wasn't the answer he wanted. So I think for a period in, in his life, he was confused. All right. Turn with me to Luke chapter 7. I'll come back to Paul in a moment. I just want to lay a biblical foundation that I'm not just preaching the ideas of man. I'm not just pr preaching a cultural thing, although I think it is a cultural thing. Um, it, it's very much in the Bible, and I hope to make a case for that this morning. John the Baptist. John the Baptist, perhaps Jesus said he was the second greatest man born of woman. He was filled with the Spirit in his mother's womb. But we read in verse 19, Luke chapter 7, John calling to him two of his disciples sent them to the Lord Jesus saying, Are you he who is to come or shall we look for another? He's doubting the very identity, mission, and character of Jesus Christ. It just seems rather odd, but he didn't see Jesus getting the Romans out of the world. And Jesus sent word back to John, go tell John, verse 22, that the blind receive the sight, uh, the lame and lepers are cleansed, the lame walk, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is he who takes no offense at me. John, being a human being, took offense at the character and identity and mission of Jesus. This really never made sense to me until I was listening to a podcast recently, until I read AJ's book on overcoming doubt, that John the Baptist doubted Jesus. His cousin doubted him. So I'm gonna, I've already kind of started the message, but I plan to start the message with a funny anecdotal story. I want to read this to you. I got a kick out of it because I want to get you into the idea uh, Jessica and I didn't really plan, and yet the, the, together, but her children's story, uh, I think, relates in a very, very indirect way, in a very direct way, about sensing God all around us, but sometimes we even doubt his presence or that he's with us. A new pastor, a new pastor decided to visit the children's Sunday school. The teacher introduced him and said, Pastor, this morning we're studying Joshua. That's wonderful, said the new pastor. Let's see what you're learning. So the pastor asked, who tore down the walls of Jericho? I didn't do it, said Johnny shyly. Taken back, the pastor asked, come on now, who tore down the walls of Jericho? The teacher said, pastor, little Johnny's a good boy. If he says he didn't do it, I believe he didn't do it. Flustered, the pastor went to the Sunday school director to talk about the incident. The director looked worried and said, well, pastor, we've had some problems with Johnny before. Let me talk to him and see what we can do. Really bothered now, the new pastor told the deacons the whole story, including the responses of the teacher and the director. A white-haired gentleman thoughtfully stroked his chin and said, well, pastor, I move, we just take money from the general fund to pay for the walls and leave it at that. <laughs> I love it. That sounds like a good church board meeting, doesn't it? Somebody's confused about a lot of things. Have you ever been confused about more deeper things in your life? I'm sure we all have. Confused. And so what I want to do is just walk you through, first of all, some scriptural examples that I think where some people were confused. Let's make Bible characters real and human as we look at our own lives about perhaps confusion in our own life. I'm not trying to champion doubt. I'll probably repeat that phrase a number of times this morning. I'm not trying to lift up confusion as some sort of thing. God is not the author of confusion but we are human beings, and the sun doesn't always shine brightly sometimes on us. There are clouds in the sky. So what do we do with things of our life? Let's at least look at some Bible characters, and then I'm going to talk about some questions we often ask. 
Uh, let's start with some scriptures about some Bible characters. I'm going to go through these very fast here today. Paul's thorn in the flesh. I've already referred to that. I've already read that story. How Paul had this ugly thorn, whatever it was, physical, emotional, relational, misunderstanding, a judgment against him, whatever it is. He suffered painfully with this thorn in the flesh. And he, and he besought the Lord, get it out of my life. God didn't seem to, God heard his prayers, but, but God didn't seem to remove that thorn as far as we know. But he gave him grace. He gave him a different answer. There's nothing wrong with that answer. It's just that Paul, for a season in his life, and he wrote in another place in one of his letters, I'm perplexed but not driven to despair. How many of us have been perplexed but not driven to despair? have to raise your hand on that but I loved it when AJ at Leadership Tuna the chapel was filled with what 250 300 people and he simply stood up and he said anybody here ever struggle with doubt every hand went up so your brothers and sisters across the region struggle with something about doubt in their life and I do too Paul struggled a little bit with this thorn in the flesh. What do you do with that? Secondly, how about Job? How about Job? He certainly is a testimony to us. Job didn't see what was going on in the heavenly realm. Job didn't see God and Satan's discussion and Satan's attacks on him. He's just losing all of his family, all of his possessions, even the shirt off his back. And, and he doesn't know what's going on. He's a little bit confused. A little bit, to say the least. I'll get to Job maybe later on. I would say, thirdly, how about Sarah? Sarah of the Old Testament, Abraham's wife. Genesis chapter 18, where God told Abraham, the promise is going to come through Sarah, not through one of your mistresses. It's going to come through <laughs> uh, Sarah. And in Genesis 18, a heavenly visitor, we take it to be perhaps what we call theologically a theophany, just God visiting Sarah and Abraham at their tent. And Sarah is behind the tent. And uh, Sarah goes, I'm too old to feel pleasure and to get pregnant. And she laughs. And it's not a joyful laughter. It's a mocking laughter. And the visitor says, why is Sarah laughing? And she comes out from behind the tent. I wasn't laughing. And the heavenly visitor, I think it was God, said, Oh, but you were laughing. You were mocking at this wonderful provision that's going to come through you at your elderly age. She was mocking. She laughed at her dilemma to believe God. Okay? God dealt with that. She got pregnant and had Isaac. And what was Isaac's name? But it is laughter. She called his name laughter. Here's a fourth one. We already talked about John the Baptist, but I just want to reiterate this. Are we to look for another Jesus because you ain't doing your work? Could you close that door up there? Thank you. Thank you. It's one thing. I, I love people talking, whatever they're doing, but that echo. Um, John the Baptist, what a great, the forerunner of the Messiah led revivals, and then he sends two of his he, he, he messages on Facebook. Are we to look for another? It'd be like somebody standing up in church and going, I don't believe in the Bible or the resurrection or the death of Christ. That's how offended John the Baptist was in his belief system. Mm. And finally, I guess that was... Finally, I just want to raise this. Is it okay to wrestle with doubts and unanswered questions in your life? Is it okay? You know, I've got some pastor friends that I, I am truly loyal to and love. They would struggle with this question. You should never preach this, pastor. Maybe you're kind of of that uh, mindset. You should always preach victory. Victory in Jesus. You should always preach faith. And I will next week. And I, I, will, I do preach faith. But is it okay to wrestle with doubts and unanswered questions in your life? I think it is, or else I wouldn't raise it.
For those of you who were here a couple, three weeks ago, I talked about one time we lived in a parsonage that had a beautiful basement. And this basement was awesome. I could do things in this basement. I put up a basketball hoop for Joshua and ended up playing on it most of the time myself. Uh, it was just awesome. Store stuff down there. It was, every, it was every person's dream to have a basement like that. But we didn't live there. We didn't live there. We lived upstairs. We stored things down there. I think, I think doubt and questioning and wrestling with angels and all kinds of things is, is part of our walk of faith. It's okay to go into the basement once in a while and ask yourself some deeper questions. Ask God some deeper questions. Why didn't this work out in my life? What are you doing in my life? I, I found this strange but good depiction, I think, of Jacob wrestling with the angel. What is that, Genesis 32? Guess who won that one? But the point is, he was wrestling. That's why I call this wrestling with angels. What do you do with some deeper questions that you have about God, about, about your life, about things? Now, here's what I think happens. I don't champion doubt. But here's what I think happens. Do people really run away from Jesus uh, when they struggle with these deeper questions of life? I don't know. Here's what I think. Here's my best opinion of what I think happens. I think it's a silence in the pew and in the pulpit. People don't leave church. People don't really leave the faith, but they sit silently in the pew or stand in the pulpit wrestling with some deeper issues about their faith. And nobody addresses those. Maybe just this kind of acknowledging that it's okay kind of helps you address something. And I also think this is what happens. When somebody gets physically healed and you don't, you probably think in your mind, what's wrong with me? Or when somebody gets blessed financially and you're struggling to make ends meet, you might think, what's wrong with me? I think that happens in churches. I think it happens in the basement of your soul and in my soul. It's okay, we're human. Go hear an amen on that. Are you depressed yet? Right, you wanted to be lifted up. I feel good, I've come to church. It's pastor appreciation. Why should I bring a message like this on pastor appreciation Sunday, right? Let me give you some common problems or questions I think we all have, right? Why isn't something progressing the way I've been praying? Anybody had a dream in their heart? Anybody got some things that you've been lifting before the Lord and it's not progressing the way that you want? In fact, it could be going the opposite way. How about someone you've been praying for and they don't seem to get better? They don't seem to see things the way that you see them. Why isn't it happening, God? Why aren't you removing this thorn uh, or this obstacle? out of my life. Here's another question I think that we struggle with. Why did this happen to me or to us? Why? I mean, don't we all go there? Why, did, why is this happening to me? I didn't deserve this. I didn't do anything to cause it. Here's a third question we never ask because it would confront our self-pity. Why am I so blessed? You ever wondered that? Why am I so blessed? Why am I born in this time, in this season? Why was I born in this great country? Why was I born into uh, apparent prosperity compared to three quarters of the rest of the world? Why am I so blessed? You ever ask yourself that question? That's a good question to ask yourself and ask God. Here's a fourth one. Why is there so much evil and suffering in the world? I mean, if you haven't asked that question, in a long time. I, I, I get it. There are answers to that. Man's free will. The devil creates evil and suffering. But why is there so much? Why doesn't God do more? I could even ask questions about the return of Christ, but I, I don't want to go there this morning. Why is there so much evil and suffering in the world? How about this one? How come they did that? You know, some of our doubts and some of our wrestling with angels... I want you to understand this. In fact, if this is the only thing you take away this morning, this could be the, the, the price of admission. 
Some of our doubts and some of our wrestling with angels have nothing to do with God. It has to do with other people. Where you judge other people's sincerity, their motives, or their integrity. How come they did that or they're not doing that? Some of our doubts, let me say it again, have nothing to do with God or the Bible. It has to do with questioning other people's sincerity, integrity. So you can sit there and say, I think I've got all kinds of clarification about my relationship with God, but I really doubt that person right there. I'm just picking on you. I don't doubt you. But that's what we do. How come they did that? And then the final thing I just want to put in front of you this morning, it's not a question, but I think we can all identify with it. I don't understand that in the Bible. In fact, I would, I would suggest to you, if you're reading the Bible, I love that quote by Francis Chan, you read something in the Bible that you don't agree with, you've got to assume you're wrong. I love that quote. But the last time that you opened your Bible and read something that you don't understand, praise God, because you're dealing with God. I don't understand that in the Bible. Well, good that you're looking in the Bible and that you're not just going to Google something. <laughs> I'm preaching to me, sometimes I Google. I want some information especially if it's on Wikipedia, and I, it's a quick, quick reference, but I don't understand that in the Bible. If you can identify with that, that's huge. I'm trying to raise the problem. Bible characters struggled with wrestling with angels, things in their life. We do too, those are common questions. But in some time remaining this morning, here's what I want to do. I want to give you... I, I've, I've got more, but I just want to give you three this morning. Do I hear an amen on that? I want to give you some ways to navigate unanswered questions in your, land, in, in your journey of faith. Are you ready? I'm going to give you three. I'm going to unpack three sort of strategies. I'm not trying to fix these questions. I'm not even trying to fix you. I'm not even trying to fix me. I'm trying to acknowledge that we are human beings and faith is a gift from God. I think I'll talk about faith more next week. But faith is a gift from God, and um, we can walk in faith. But how do we navigate some unanswered questions of our lives? So if you're taking notes, I, I want to do three things. Number one, resist simplistic cliche answers. Resist simplistic answers. When I thought about, as a pastor... What is one thing I want to say about unanswered questions in your life? This is the first one that just popped in my heart. Resist simplistic cliche answers. If you were here two or three weeks ago, I probably offended some people when I said, I hate the cliche. There's a reason for everything. <laughs> some of you may have come here going, you quoted that this morning. Let me unpack this one for a moment. Resist simplistic, cliche answers. Nope, we'll get to that one in a moment, just talking to myself. I have a simple faith. Jesus loves me, this I know. Right. I believe in the Bible. Amen. You, you hope your pastor believes in the Bible. I even believe in the table of contents. I believe in the, I don't even know if I have a leather bound, but I believe in that too. I believe in the Bible. I believe in the ancient creeds, the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in church history, good, bad, and indifferent. I, I, believe, uh, I believe in Creed 1 and Creed 2, the Rocky films. I like those movies. Uh, I believe in the ancient creeds. That was a joke, by the way, about Creed 1, Creed 2. Some of you didn't get that. I have a simple faith. Jesus loves me. Jesus rose again. Jesus died for me. Jesus is coming again. I also, on the flip side of the coin, I think I have a mysterious faith. I think faith is mysterious. 
I think there's a lot of things in this book and in life that are frankly mysterious. Do I hear an amen? Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, my ways and my thoughts are higher than your ways and your thoughts, says the Lord. And sometimes I think this, this simple cliche answers, we want to fix everything in a sermon. I'm tempted to do that. We want to fix everything in life because you know that your favorite TV drama show ends in an hour. Everything's fixed. Every relationship is fixed. <laughs> I think that subconsciously trains us that if you don't have an answer, pastor, I'm leaving the church. Okay, I'm just saying I have a simple faith and I have a faith that's mysterious and so do you. I'll give you a great example of this. I'm tempted to give you a pretend example, but this is a real example. So if you were here last week, I talked about Billy Joe Doherty, who was pastor at, uh, I think it's called Victory Christian Center in Tulsa, Oklahoma, 17,000 member church. Remember I shared the story about how a guy came up on the stage and hit him, uh, sent him to the emergency room. And then in 2009, Billy Joe Doherty, uh, died of cancer. I think he had cancer of the throat and, and tragically at the height of his career, 17,000 member church in Tulsa. Uh, he was over, what, 80 colleges or something? Uh, a tremendous man of God died of cancer at the age of 57 in 2009. While I was doing some research on him, I uncovered something online. So never go online and do research, right? <laughs> I uncovered something. A guy honestly posted this. I couldn't believe it. But I'm going to share it with you because it's so stupid. A guy posted online the reason why he died is because he was a false teacher. That stuff's out there. That's not why he died. I don't know why he died. He certainly came from that healing tradition, that Oral Roberts healing tradition. I'm sure he had people praying for him and hands laid on him. He was so anointed with oil, he never had to take a shower. So that's a mysterious thing. But somebody wanted to post online. He's a false teacher. That's why he, he, he wasn't obeying the Bible. So that's why he died. Is that right? No, that's stupid. That's how stupid that is. Now, I don't think any of you are going to stand up and you're going to say that stuff. But I'll bet you what, it circulates between your ears. I know why that happened. It's kind of like that church in New Plymouth, Idaho, and I'm just making this up, but it's kind of like this, that church that burned down in the summer and we gave them some money and they're rebuilding and they're purchasing some new land, but they tragically lost their church building to fire. You know why that happened, right? You know why that happened. There was sin in the church. That's why it happened. <laughs> There's sin in every church. And so what a stupid uh, analogy, but... Some people love to go there because it's a simplistic, cliche answer. I mean, if you've got prophetic understanding of why things are going on, then you better be speaking out and you better be right on. But we love those type of things. So when you're dealing with unanswered questions in your life that are deeply personal to you, and you're probably not going to share them in church, resist the simple answers. God loves you. I hate, this is a, it has a wonderful plan for your life. He does. I know the plans the Lord says I have for you. But just resist those type of answers that make you feel good. Secondly, I, I found this to be very helpful in my life. Learn to ponder things. I think this is where Jessica's story kind of fits in here because uh, what a great story about bats. I never thought, I would have never guessed bats. That was a great one. Learn to ponder and to sense God. So I'm going to give you a lady in the Bible that pondered some things. She pondered miracles. Luke 2.19, remember when the shepherds came to visit Mary and Joseph, Jesus has just been born. 
they tell them, they tell Mary and Joseph what the angels had told them and they arrive at the, at the manger scene and then they leave and it says in Luke 2, 19 that Mary pondered these things. She pondered and she kept these things in her heart. I did some research on the word ponder. It means to throw together, throw together in your head, throw together in your heart. It also means to confer with each other. But it means she put together some things. I think she's, she's walking, she's just given birth to Jesus, and she's pondering what's going on in my life. That's pondering blessing. And then in the temple, in the temple, when Jesus said, Don't, didn't you know I was supposed to be, he's 12 years old, didn't you know I was supposed to be about my father's business? Almost the same word appears in Luke 2, 51, except it says she kept these things in her heart. It's like, it's like she hasn't put things together yet, I don't think. Who's my boy? Who is he really? We kind of look back and think, oh, she figured it out. I don't think so. I think she's figuring it out. Like any mother would. I know she was anointed of God. I do know that. But she kept things and she's pondering. I'm going to suggest to you, when was the last time you pondered your life? What God, why, why you are alive right now, why God has done some things in your life, why God is keeping you alive, why God is doing some things, you know, pondered miracles, pondered your life story, pondered your blessings, pondered some things that you put deep in your heart. I think it's a thing about worshiping. I think it's a thing about sensing God's presence every day. We're not very good at this, at least I'm not. I'm not very good at pondering. Because we just got to rush and rush and rush. We don't take the time to ponder, what is God really saying to me? I think that's an answer to some of the unanswered questions. That's a strategy. That's a tool. But on the negative side, in suffering, this is, I find this comical. It's true, but it's a little bit anecdotal and comical for me. I, I hope you understand my sixth sense of humor. Not, not sixth sense, a sick sense of humor. With suffering, with suffering. I want you to ponder this picture for a moment. There's some interesting verses in Job chapter 2. Job has lost everything. I think he's even got boils. He's filled with acne all over his body. Boils, that's worse than acne. His friends see him from afar. They actually wept over him. And then some interesting verses. <laughs> it says that Job's friends and Job sat on the ground for seven days and seven nights and his friends did, did not say a word. Isn't that interesting? They did not say a word for seven days and seven nights. Can you picture this? They're sitting around the campfire. <laughs> Doesn't say that, but <laughs> didn't say a word. I think that's a miracle. Don't you want to fix other people when they're going through suffering? <laughs> I got a word for you. They didn't say a word for seven days and seven nights. I think they're pondering. They're pondering. What's going on? I find it kind of comical, I find it anecdotal, but I find it pretty profound. They didn't say a word. They didn't say any positive things or negative things. They just sat there for a week, pondering. I think they were. I think it's a key to unlocking and, and rising out of the basement and dealing with some of the things that are very deep and personal in your life and in my life. I think, I think it's a key of learning how to ponder. The final thing I want to share with you, and then I want to finish with a story by Corey Ten Boom that really struck home with me. I hope it does with you. I want to say thirdly, a third strategy, if you will, about life's unanswered questions that kind of silently exist may cause you to run away from Jesus. I hope they don't, because there are answers, is this. 
Um, I'll skip all that. Dig deeper in your relationship with Jesus. Dig deeper. In fact, if this is all you go away with today, fantastic. Dig deeper in your relationship with Jesus when you've got unanswered questions. Don't run away from Jesus. See, there's a difference between scoffing and humility. And I want to make sure, not just as a pastor, but it certainly kind of moves in that direction as a pastor, uh, but just as a human being in front of God, I want to recognize the difference in my life between scoffing and humility. I can ask God questions all day, which is pondering for me. Why is this going on? Um, but I'm not scoffing. I'm not throwing dust in the air. I'm not raising arguments just to get my way. I'm digging deeper in my relationship with Jesus. I want to encourage you, don't run away from Jesus. Run to him. Run to him. Lay your stuff at his feet. Keep praying over things. Psalm 13, verse 1, David cried. In fact, just read the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms is filled with one of the greatest men of God just pouring his heart out to God. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? This is the same guy that wrote, Thou art with me. And now he's crying out, Will you forget me forever? <laughs> yeah, because he's in the basement. There are some things going on in his life. How long, O oh Lord? Then I, then I think of, uh, I don't want to go there. Just talking to myself again. I, I think of, of Thomas. Thomas going to the upper room. I'm not going to believe until I, until I see something and touch something. He's running back to Jesus. Jesus is not afraid of your doubts. Other Christians may be, the church may be, but Jesus ain't. He ain't afraid of, you're not the first person, nor will you be the last to raise all kinds of tough questions before the Lord God Almighty. He can handle you. <laughs> the church may not be able to. Maybe I won't be able to. Maybe you can't handle me. I don't know. But Jesus can handle us. <laughs> whatever it is, whatever it is, that's deeply personal. Why that person passed away in your life or why some things failed in your life or why didn't your life move in this trajectory. Whatever it is, deeply personal in your life, run to Jesus with that. Because you'll find peace, you'll find, you'll find his love. <laughs> Let me just give you this silly analogy, then I'll move to my final story about Corey Ten Boom, which I thought was just a powerful story. So Jennifer was gone um, about a week ago, gone overnight. When the master chef is gone, I want you to know that I pitch in and I make a meal. Wrong. I went to Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> Fast food is so much easier, right? When there's no cook in the house. I mean, I can handle soup and stuff like that, but... <sighs> Dumb analogy, yes. When you're faced with some unanswered questions in your life, you want fast food to satisfy something in you, but it's not satisfying. You yourself need to go to the stove called the Bible. You yourself need to go to the stove called prayer. You yourself need to go and prepare for you some food that comes directly from God through his word and in prayer and from the Holy Spirit. Do I hear an amen? amen. I mean, that's what you need to do. It isn't just about living on fast food and hopefully the pastor's message will... Uh, make me feel better about my life or, or maybe that YouTube clip will, will get me or my favorite internet preacher will spark some renewed faith in me and you know what I'm not saying that's fast food but it's like fast food because sometimes you don't own that stuff but when you dig it, when you cook it, when you prepare it you own it You aren't always going to Kentucky Fried Chicken. You're owning stuff in your spirit. You're not living off of other people's offenses and words. You're owning the truth that's in you. That's what you're owning. I'm not mad at you. I just feel this awesome anointing right now. 
because you're owning it. You're cooking it. You're getting on your knees with Psalm 23. And you're going, yes, Lord, how long? But you are with me, and I praise you. And you're not getting off your knees until you're saying, I feel peace. There's so much fast food that's out there. And some of it's really good. But the problem is you don't own it. I don't own Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> it tastes good. And it filled me for a few hours, and I was hungry again. But you've got to own stuff. And that's what God rewards. I think God rewards that kind of faith. Now, I wanted to finish with this great story. Because I'm talking about unanswered questions, right? I'm talking about some strategies that perhaps will help you to resist the, the cliché answers, the easy answers. I'm talking about run to Jesus. I'm talking about learning to ponder. Such knowledge is high, I cannot attain it type of, of thing. I want you to look, I'm going to read this story and then I'm going to close in prayer. I just thought, this is so appropriate. Corey Ten Boom, I've told you many stories, but this is a story about her childhood. Corey Ten Boom, about age 10, was reading a poem as she and her father traveled by train from Amsterdam to another city. And, and, and Corey Ten Boom asked her dad, what does sex sin mean? She asked. She describes what happened next. So she's asking a question about sex from a poem that she's sex sin or something. He turned to me as he always did when answering a question, but to my surprise, he said nothing. At last he stood up, lifted his traveling case from the rack over our heads, and set it on the floor. Will you carry it off the train, Corey? he asked. I stood up and I tugged at it. It was crammed with watches and spare parts he had purchased that morning. It's too heavy, I said. Yes, he said, and it would be a pretty poor father who would ask his little girl to carry such a load. It's the same way, Corey, with knowledge. Some knowledge is too heavy for children. When you are older and stronger, you can bear it. But for now, you must trust me to carry it for you. And then she writes, I was satisfied. More than satisfied, I was wonderfully at peace. There were answers to this and all my hard questions, but for now, I was content to leave them in my father's keeping. The author of this talks about God is mysterious and not simply because he is God, but because we are children. And in his love, our childhood is protected. We should view both childhood and God's mysteries as a source of wonder and even comfort. There is a creator and we are among the created. There are answers to all things safely in our Father's keeping. I just found that story to be not only inspiring, but very insightful. There are things we cannot lift right now. There are things I think God says that's off limits. Just walk with me. Does that make sense? Let's stand. Yes, thank you, Lord, for your wonderful grace. Thank you that many times we wrestle with things. We don't even know if we're wrestling with things, but we are. We thank you that whatever it is in our life, we thank you, yes, there are answers. Maybe the answer is we can't carry it right now. Maybe that knowledge or that answer would make us proud. Maybe that answer would cause us to go a different direction. Does it mean you're, you're our answer? But it doesn't mean that there aren't answers. We thank you for this <laughs> life's unanswerable questions sometimes that hit us, that are deeply personal. But even that, Lord, even before we sing this song from, a, from an author who lost his family in a shipwreck, but he could later write, it is well with my soul. We thank you, Jesus, for your peace.
for your love. We thank you that you always rise us above some of these questions just into your presence. But we are human, and you walk with us in our basement. You're always there, no matter what we cry out for, no matter what we're saying, why did this happen to us, or uh, what are you saying to me? Help us to ponder, help us to run to you, and help us avoid simple answers that sometimes just make us feel good. We love you, Lord. We thank you for your power. We thank you even acknowledging some of this stuff helps us unpack our faith. At least I hope it does, Jesus. And we thank you in your precious name. Amen. It is well with my soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well. thank you for your grace. Thank you that it is well with our soul, much more than we ever realize. Thank you as we fellowship now, that that, that would just be a blessing upon every person. In your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.